Hi, I'm fashion historian Amber Butcharts. Today we're here at Roxeter Roman City, which is cared for by English heritage. During the third century, when Britain was part of the once powerful Roman Empire, this was one of the largest cities in the country. From tradespeople to trendsetters, Roxeter was a thriving metropolis of power, politics and pampering. Today, we're going to be exploring the Roman beauty trends that quite literally changed the face of Britain. We're going to show you how you can recreate a Roman-inspired look at home, and we're going to be taking a look at some makeup artefacts found right here at Roxeter. So what are we waiting for? Let's explore Roman Britain. Rebecca, hello. Hi Amber, it's nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. Now, today is very exciting. Britain was a province of the Roman Empire for around 400 years, from 43 AD. Today, we're here at Roxeter Roman City, which was the fourth largest city in Roman Britain, comparable in size to Pompeii in Italy. So it was a really busy, bustling, thriving place to live and work. Now, what's especially exciting for us is that there have been a lot of cosmetics artefacts found here on the site as well so we'll be looking into those later. Now tell me about the Roman look that we're going to recreate today. Well we know the Roman Empire was big and it existed for a long time so we decided to take a starting point and our starting point is a woman called Julia Dongma. Um, she was the wife of Emperor Septimius Severus in the third century AD and we're going to be creating a Roman style look on our beautiful model Sarah. Hello. And let's get started. Great. Now, many people in Roman Britain would have known about Julia Domina due to her status as the Empress, the Emperor's wife. So, how are we going to bring this look to life? Well, we're going to start at a point that I always think of when I think of the Romans, and that is bathing and cleanliness. Mm -hmm. The Romans were famous, I guess, for their bathing process. And actually, it's really interesting because if you've been to a spa or you've been to a hammam, a lot of the processes that you see in spas today are really, really similar to what the Romans were using. So you would have cold rooms, steam rooms, saunas, warm rooms, and massages, and maybe some beauty therapists. Mm. Sounds lovely, yeah, doesn't it? I'm glad I came. <laughs> So we're going to start our first step in the um, Roman bathing ritual by massaging Sarah's arm with a little bit of oil. We're using just a cheap olive oil at this stage. I would like your arm please, yes. So oil is what helps to start the cleaning process. So we'll massage it in. So while I'm doing this, I think it's really interesting to think about how important appearance was to Romans. Well, appearance, bathing, grooming, all of these things are really important for Roman and Roman British identity. Um, all aspects of the way you present yourself could sort of signal things like gender, maybe your rank if you were in the military, amulets might be worn for protection, so a variety of different things. Now also something that really shows the importance of grooming is toilette sets that have been found including things like tweezers and nail cleaners as well which people might wear on their person so just really shows the importance of keeping a clean body. Yeah it's really interesting that tools for beauty seem to be a really important part of the uh, Roman process and there's one tool that I'm excited to be wow. using. <laughs> I know. <Okay>. Yeah, on you. <laughs> this is a strigil and this was used by um, slaves in the baths to clean the skin. So oh once gosh. you've massaged oil into the skin, maybe then you'd go off and do some more bathing or some exercise or some swimming and then your slave would take the strigil and they run it down the skin and this removes oh, that doesn't hurt. the oil <laughs> and the grease and the dirt. And oil is a really effective cleanser. We still use it today and most modern skincare lineups have an oil cleanser. Because oil is lipophilic and that means it attracts like, it attracts itself and it attracts dirt. So it's a super, super effective way of okay. cleansing and also exfoliating the skin. Wow. 
So in the age before YouTube and Instagram and magazines, how did the Romans get their information about new trends and styles? Well, luckily for us, we do have quite a few images of Julia Domna. And one source in particular that we can draw on is coins. Now, coins were a great way for the ruling family to disseminate their image, to show how they wanted to be presented, to really relay their power. Women on coins tended to be either goddesses or empresses like Julia. But what's particularly useful for us is that it also shows us what hairstyles were current as well. Well, we'll do the next step in our Roman skincare regime and I'm going to moisturise your skin using something which we know as lanolin. Now lanolin is the grease from sheep's wool, which sounds a bit disgusting, but it's an incredibly effective moisturiser. It's really, really emollient and you can feel it's really quite um, heavy and sticky, but it actually contains a lot of ingredients that in modern day skincare we really look out for. So it's got AHAs and BHAs, alpha hydroxy acids, beta hydroxy acids. These are incredible for your skin, so your skin will feel fantastic. But it might be a little bit smelly. Um, and a couple of writers in Rome complained about the smell of their wives and girlfriends using lanolin on their skin. <laughs> but you might be pleased to know that this is not the smelliest or weirdest ingredient that we could have used on you today. In some parts of the Roman Empire, um, there was an ingredient called crocodalia that was used. Um, reports vary as to whether that's the intestines of a crocodile, oh. yeah, or the dung of a crocodile oh. that you would spread on your face. <laughs> I don't want to be a Roman. <laughs> well, but it would tighten and tone your skin. Interested okay. yet? No. no. Okay. <laughs> now, one thing we should keep in mind is that, as with today, women in Roman Britain do not form a homogenous group. The Roman Empire is huge geographically and there's a lot of movement within it as well. So we've got people coming here from the Mediterranean, from the Middle East, like Julia Domna from Syria and from North Africa as well. And that's on top of the groups who are here already when the Romans arrive, like the Cornovi tribe who are living around the area of Roxeter. The Roman Empire was really international, wasn't it? It really was, and we see that in some of the textile fragments that remain as well. For example, we see Chinese silks or silks made with Chinese yarns that have been found on sites in Colchester, just incredible. And it's thought that cosmetics could have been imported from as far away as Egypt, which was also a Roman province at the time as well. So travel and trade was really, really extensive at this point. It's incredible how far things could travel within the empire. But there's something that we have that I think is really exciting that is, we think, exclusive to Britain. Um, and it's a Roman cosmetics grinder. This is a replica. Uh, it's so fascinating. So you would take your mortar and into your mortar you'd put a piece of charcoal or perhaps antimony or maybe even soot, which is what some Romans used to create an eyeliner or a coal. And then you would take your pestle and you'd grind it up to make a powder. You'd perhaps put a drop of oil or fat into there. And then this grinder is so specially shaped that it fits on the eye. So you can use this actually as your makeup applicator. Now this look in particular that we associate with Julia Domna, the dark eyes, the dark brows, we see this in depictions of women in the later Roman era as well, throughout the empire. So it was clearly very popular. Well, I'm going to leave you getting to grips with that and I'm going to go and find out more about the cosmetics artefacts that have been found here at Roxeter. So I will see you later. Have fun. Cameron, tell me about your work as a curator with English Heritage. I'm the curator of collections for the West Midlands. I look after the things that are on display at the sites, in the various site museums, and for the large collection of material that is held in warehouses across the country. Now you've done some work specifically looking at Roman cosmetics that have been found here at Roxeter. 
Tell me how that came about. The first proper excavations took place here in the 1910s and the 1920s. And that material hadn't really been re-examined for a long time. And when I recently came back to, to go through those collections, I found um, three items that had previously been described as lunate pendants, the kind of thing that would hang from a necklace. And now we know that those are actually little cosmetic sets, grinding sets wow. that were used for eye makeup in the Roman period. Amazing. And are they specific to Britain? They are specific to Britain, yes. And they, um, you start to see them in the first century AD. And they do seem to be a response within this country to the import of, of cosmetics and ideas about personal beauty that are coming here from the Mediterranean. I'm really excited to see some of these objects. What have you brought with you today? Well, here are two components of, of two different cosmetic grinder sets. Wow. Um, they, they come in little sets, but you tend to find them individually because people take them apart from each other to use them. What other cosmetic items do we have? We have a surprising number of cosmetic items. We have um, nail cleaners, a wide variety of nail cleaners. Um, we have tweezers. Depilation was a big thing. Hairlessness was, was very attractive. And uh, one of my personal favorites is this uh, little perfume bottle. We have loads of perfume bottles. What else do these discoveries tell us about Roman life? I think they really tell us that Roman life was urban life and that when the Romans came, they brought with them this whole range of new influences and new materials and new consumer goods that simply did not exist before in this country. Cameron, thank you so much. We're midway through our transformation, so I'm going to go and see how they're getting on. Thank you. Oh, wow, look at that. It's so bright. I love it. We're finally using some colour. <laughs> yeah. Very excited. Um, we've got some written evidence that suggests that Roman women would use ground up precious stones or minerals to create eyeshadows. So maybe using lapis lazuli or malachite or azurite. Um, sometimes even saffron as well, ground up, maybe with a touch of oil to create an eyeshadow. Oh. Now, I did do some grinding. I ground some lapis lazuli, and this is what you get. It's oh, a really, wow. really beautiful colour. I'm not actually using it on Sarah because I didn't actually want to put granules of rock on her <laughs> eye because my grinding skills are not the best. So I'm using a modern equivalent, which is a brightly coloured pigment powder. It's so gorgeous. And it looks amazing. I'm applying it with my finger and I also mocked up a bit of speculation as to what a Roman eyeshadow <laughs> blender might look like. This is a bit of lamb's wool with some wool lashed onto a stick. Lovely. For blending out the edges. Incredible. Well, the Roman world would have been a really vibrant place. We tend to think of people as just wearing white at this time, and I think there are a couple of reasons behind this. Firstly, it's because of statues, which now are white, but at the time would mostly have been painted in quite bright colours, but this has kind of tainted our idea of what the ancient world looked like. In fact, we have writing from Ovid in The Art of Love, and he talks about woolen clothes in a number of different colours. Saffron, amethyst, green, sky blue, watercolour, which sounds lovely, chestnut, almond. It really would have been a rainbow, bright, vibrant place to live. Let's finish this look off with some lips and cheeks, and I'm adding a small amount of colour. This is modern, safe version of vermilion mixed with goose fat and beeswax. So hairstyles were a really important aspect of display in the Roman world. What are you going to do to Sarah's hair today? We're going to be using a wig today and it's not necessarily the case that every single woman would have used a wig to get these elaborate styles. 
but wigs were used in the Roman Empire. Well, hairstyles were clearly very important in Roman Britain because hair pins are one of the most common sight finds that we find around the country. And this actually started to die out towards the sort of end of the fourth century. And it's been suggested that that could be because it was at this period where Christianity began to become quite widespread. So ideas around modesty and display change, and it's thought that women maybe started covering their heads. So there are fewer of these very elaborate hairstyles. While you work your magic, I'm going to go and find out more about Roxeter as a Roman city. I'll see you later. Bye. Andrew, tell me about your work as an English heritage historian. Well, I'm a properties historian at English Heritage. Uh, I have a special interest in our Roman sites, uh, which are spread across the country. And my job is to uh, research the history of our sites and help present them to the public. Now we're standing among these Roman ruins, but it would have been a really bustling, thriving, busy place to live and work. Can you paint a picture of what it would have been like here in the third century? Well, Roxeter was founded as an army fortress on land taken from the Conovi tribe as part of the conquest of the northwest of Britain. By the third century, it's developed into a thriving city. And much like any other city in the Roman Empire, you'd have the whole range of different people uh, from across the Roman world. Some would be a very high status, so the rich uh, men that served on the city council. Others might be uh, craftspeople or traders, uh, farmers, and of course slaves that did a lot of the, the, the unseen hard work. Where exactly are we right now? Right now we're standing in Roxeter's famous public bathhouse. 1800 years ago you would be able to uh, smell the, uh, the fires burning in the, in the furnaces that heated the baths, you'd be able to hear the chattering of the bathers and perhaps the cries of the vendors uh, selling their wares in the marketplace next door. So bathing was really important for the Romans. Talk me through how these baths would have been used. Well, bathing was an essential part of Roman life. Every Roman citizen, rich or poor, man, woman or child, would expect to bathe as a daily part of their ritual. And we're not talking about a quick wash, we're talking about a series of quite involved, elaborate processes. So you'd start in the coldest room, the frigidarium, and then you move to the tepidarium, which is a warmer room, before finally going to the caldarium, which was the hottest room where you'd be able to get a hot bath. Once you'd had enough of the heat, you'd probably go back to the beginning and take a cold plunge in order to refresh yourself. Oh, I love a plunge pool. This all sounds amazing. Sign me up. <laughs> There's plenty to do here. Bathing was quite a social uh, process, so you'd come here maybe to meet friends or to do a business deal. Um, and there's also a lot of, of ways to spend your money and occupy your time. So in the Basilica, there would have been space for uh, people to provide services. Perhaps there might be someone to, to do your hair or to, to, to do your makeup. And just next door was a small market where it might well have been possible for you to buy the latest trends in makeup or jewellery or, or textiles for your clothes. So our look today is inspired by the Empress Julia Domna, wife of Septimius Severus. How did they come to be in Britain? Well, in 208 AD, Septimius Severus, the Roman Emperor, comes to Britain in order to mount a military campaign to the north of Hadrian's Wall. With him is the Empress Julia Domna and their sons, and so for a short period of time, the Roman Empire is ruled from Britain. Thanks so much, Andrew. They should be finished with the makeup now, so I'm gonna go and check out how they're going. Thank you. Rebecca, this is incredible. How have you created this hair? It's so elaborate. Thanks. It was so much fun to do. We've taken the two front sections of the wig, plaited them, and then two of the back sections we've drawn out into long thick plaits and I sewed those together and then placed them onto the top of the head and then sewed that onto the top of the wig. Wow. And it means that you get this hairstyle that is completely invincible. It's held up with no hairpins, it's just held up with sewing. And it means that these elaborate hairstyles can then stay up 
for maybe a week or so at a time. Wow. So it's like going to get your hair set at the hairdressers, that kind of thing? It's kind of exactly that, because you can't really sew your own hair. So this kind of hairstyle means that you have to go to a hairdresser to get it done. Wow. Just looks absolutely incredible. Thank you. I think the outfit looks amazing as well. But I have to say, it's not what I was expecting from a Roman outfit. Well, we have modelled what Sarah is wearing here on a bas-relief of Julia Domna from the Arch of Septimius Severus in modern-day Libya. Now, she's wearing a short sleeve tunic, which would have been the height of fashion, and this cloak uh, known as the pala as well. Now, what I really love about it is the colour. I think that's what we don't, we're not necessarily expecting. This is um, linen we've got here and wool. Wool takes colour really, really well. Now, it's likely from the elaborate folds in the bas relief that she probably would have been wearing silk as an empress. But here we've gone for a bit more egalitarian linen and wool, which are really important fabrics in Roman Britain. But it is the colour that's fantastic. Now, this purple I love. Purple was a really important colour colour in the Roman world. You could create a really vibrant, bright purple using the secretions of a sea snail, uh, which is very, yeah, very, very expensive. But to create it here in Roman Britain, you could have used a plant like madder for red and woad for blue, for example. Wouldn't have been quite as bright, but would have given us a kind of purple. Yellow, you could create with saffron, with weld, or even with onion skins, you can use as a natural dye as well. Indeed, and moving further down, the shoes. I love the shoes that Sarah's wearing. These are really similar to some Roman shoes that were found near Hadrian's Wall. Now, trends in shoes could change relatively quickly, could be much quicker than clothing itself. And the Romans actually introduced the technology of proper leather tanning to Britain as well. So waterproof shoes begin to exist for the first time. That is amazing. So what have the Romans ever done for us? Dry feet. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it also means that we have a load of Roman shoes to use as sources as well. Incredible. We've got a lovely bit of jewellery on here. Tell me about the jewellery that Sarah's well, wearing. Here we've used a pearl necklace. Pearls were the most luxurious, most expensive jewels um, in the Roman Empire. We do have an image of Julia Domna where it looks like she's wearing a pearl necklace. So that's what we've gone for here. Jewellery could be worn by all levels of society though because you've got such a range of materials that you could use. For example, if you were very wealthy, you may wear emeralds, but if you were less wealthy, you might wear green glass beads instead. Tell me, how do you like your Roman look? The garments are quite heavy, but I think the overall look, I really like it. It's very regal. You look amazing. You look fantastic. It really suits you. Thank you for being such a brilliant model. Thank you. This tutorial was brought to life by artefacts found here at Roxeter Roman City. These objects, cared for by English heritage, show just how conscious the Romans were of their appearance and give us remarkable insight into their daily life. But the conservation of incredible sites like this is not possible without your support. To find out how you can support the charity, click the link on the screen now. Until next time, I'm Amber Butchart and thanks for joining us for another English Heritage History-inspired makeup tutorial. <laughs>